Hold on to your butt. Hey everyone, thanks for stopping here at J Hood Creative where we like to talk a little bit about comics, pop culture, superheroes, all that fun stuff. I've got a, just a little historical piece today. Something short, something quick. We get in and out, hopefully 10, 15 minutes. I recently picked up Our Army at War number 168. This is the first appearance of the Unknown Soldier. Uh, now, of course, it's a classic book, uh, Silver Age DC. Uh, plenty of art in that by uh, some cool art by Joe Kubert, as always, on Sergeant Rock. And uh, as part of this pickup, another book came along is is part of the lot. I want to talk about that a little bit today. So I've been reading this book that I got for Christmas. Slugfest, Inside the Epic 50-Year Battle Between Marvel and DC. And this is where a little bit of the chocolate and the peanut butter got mixed up. And I, I've, I've landed on a real sweet spot. So we're going to talk about uh, let's switch. Let's invite our good friend in here, camera two. So this is our army at war. Underneath the logo, it says 169. This was published in 1966, and that's an important thing to note here. Uh, so it's got uh, your standard run-of-the-mill Sergeant Rock leader story. Um, it's a relatively... I, I wouldn't say lame. It's got some cool stuff. It's got great art, Joe Kubert again. Um, but the, the the like the story beat in this is that nobody, no no German soldier is ever going to fool Sergeant Rock. And then the Sergeant Rock knows better. He knows the story and he tells it of when this German soldier got the best of him for a while took out a couple of his young troops and in the process of this battle, Sergeant Rock's eyes get damaged and this German fools him into literally putting him on his back and walking him through the desert. Now, of course, the, the giant plot hole that came immediately to mind is Sir, Sergeant Rock can't see who's dealing with, but he can surely hear him. And I'm sure Sergeant Rock would know a German accent when he heard one. Um, so even if this guy uh, was able to speak their English, I doubt it was the perfect, like, gentleman's English. So anyway, that's not why I, I bring this issue up. The reason I bring this issue up is this story, the backup. Now, I'm one that really likes to... Um, uh, uh, I wouldn't say like suit. I pride myself on being able to like name artists. Like if I see some something by someone, I can look at it and like, oh, that's so and so. This one had me stumped for a little bit, so I was trying to figure out, okay, who is this guy? Uh, I, I was very taken by the splash page here. Um, very well drawn. Um, is a little bit reminiscent of Joe Kubert, but is not Joe Kubert. Uh, this page or this panel right here, the face uh, reminds me of, uh, I believe it's Hal, not Hal Foster. Um, the guy that drew Terry the Pirates, Milton Kniff. Milton Kniff um, reminds me of him. Who A lot of these artists back in this era that grew up from the uh, the Golden Age through the Silver Age and into, or from the Golden Age into the Silver Age were very in influenced by the newspaper artist, the, the newspaper strip artist, like Milton Kniff. Uh, oddly enough to note, this is a, like I said, this published in 66. This is a story about the Vietnam War rather than uh, World War II, which I thought was interesting. But looking f through this further, you know, some of this reminds me a little bit of uh, Howard Chaikin, but of course Howard Chaikin didn't come on the scene until... Uh, the 80s so I was thinking well, wait, somebody, somebody that uh, influenced Howard Chaikin to a certain extent which that might well be the case um, so I was studying his heart I was like who is this guy it, some of the backgrounds and stuff remind me of uh, of Alex Toth which obviously this is 
um, got way too much kind of rendering in it, I think, for Al an Alex Toth. Um, but it was this panel right here that tipped me <laughs> off, that helped me understand who we're dealing with. Uh, there's something in this face, the way that half the face is in shadow, and then we've got a strong shadow underneath that cheekbone right there. And then once you, once I saw that, the way the shadows play across the, the figure there uh, tipped me off again. And as the story goes on, it becomes a little bit more frenetic. Uh, and as could be the case, maybe the deadline started looming. looming so the, the art got a little bit looser, a little bit more um, emotive. Uh, this sequence down here really uh, had me uh, kind of cemented my, my, my opinions about who this was. Uh, this page to a certain extent as well. So are you guys tracking with me? Can can you name this artist by now? you have any idea who it could be? This is a, a well-known artist that any uh, Bronze Age Marvel fan uh, will know. think it's it's interesting that even though you know so, some of the features of this uh oriental dude here are drawn i would say not correctly not very well but it's not cartoony as to be a stereotype but uh this is a great action sequence here this is definitely a, a very well trained artist and the, I think the reason it was a little bit difficult for me to figure it out was because um, of some of the things I've, I've been reading in this Slugfest book who kind of tipped me off. Um, so let's, let's pull this guy out. So Slugfest is about the battles between Marvel and DC it, on the business side, on the publishing side. And one of the things it talks about is that during the late 60s, um, DC had a very specific house style that they wanted and Marvel was a little bit more freewheeling and they weren't um, as tight as far as the art aspect goes uh, DC couldn't understand why people like Kirby and Ditko because they didn't think their art was polished enough for comic books so I want to read just a couple little quick excerpts from Slugfest <clears throat> Uh, and this first part is about the uh, the editorship at the time. Uh, so Robert Kaniger was the the editor of the, the Army the War Books. Uh, Robert Kaniger lasted as long, nearly as long as Julius Schwartz did at DC, having gotten into comics biz in 1945. By 1960, he was in charge of the company's War Books as well as Wonder Woman. Pictures from the era reveal a professorous man with a full head of black hair, wearing a smart suit and gripping a pipe. He enjoyed mountain climbing and skiing, once calling it intoxicating. He was a literary man who liked to, to reference Dante and El Greco in interviews. Uh, they also, they're going to talk about uh, Mort Weisinger, uh, Robert Kaniger, and Julius Schwartz as the, the, the head three. Uh, editors at DC at the time. Like Weisinger, Kaniger could be abusive. He was notoriously difficult to get along with and had a volcanic temper. Stories abound of him tearing into someone who criticized his writing or an artist who dared to take a small change to a script. He is rumored to have given one penciler a fawn nervous breakdown. Kaniger, Weisinger, and Schwartz made up the core of DC's editorial staff in 1960 just one year before the dawn of the so-called Marvel Age of Comics, and they represented an old-fashioned mentality that would, in a few short years, find itself woefully out of step with the changing times. They had different values and priorities from the younger generations. DC's brass grew up during the Great Depression, which had imprinted on them a respect for work and the firm that employed you. In short, they were company men. So I'm going to skip um, ahead a few pages here. And um, this talks about how certain artists would um, 
if they're they, they okay so at dc you were a company man so that meant that if you were working for dc you weren't working for anyone else so if you wanted to work for marvel and dc you had to play it um kind of close to the vest so the artists would have to take on pseudonyms in this case we're going to talk about uh, an artist that worked at marvel under the name of adam austin uh, one of the problems of the pseudonym strategy was that artists often drew with a distinctive style and recognized recognizing their work wasn't all that difficult, no matter what name was assigned to it. Well, I, your mileage may vary. It gave me a problem. Um, uh, another of DC's underutilized artists began freelancing for Marvel under the name Adam Austin in 1965. Everybody's favorite guessing game these days is trying to figure out the real identity of the Submariner's powerful penciler, Adam Austin, Lee wrote in the 1965 Bullpen Bulletins. 1965. Remember, this book we just looked at was published in 1966. Everybody's favorite guessing... Uh, I already read that part. Um, Gene Colan drew in a delicate pencil style full of lush shading, and it didn't take long for artists, for the artist to be outed. Soon after his work, his Marvel work began appearing, Colin got a call from a fan saying, don't bother trying to fool me with that Adam Austin bit. I know your work anywhere. And the death, the death knell came later when Colin was at the DC offices delivering some work. As he was headed toward the elevator to leave, the doors opened and out walked Marvel head honcho Martin Goodwin. Hi, Gene, Goodman said. And with that, all of Colin's plans of continuing to work surreptitiously surreptitiously for both companies disappeared so gene colon drew this issue of well the backup story anyway in this issue of sergeant rock uh, as a reminder here, here's what, what one of my favorite books by gene colon uh this is daredevil 156 published in 1977 i believe so this would be 10 years later or 1978, and this was beautifully inked by uh, Klaus Janssen. Uh, just like I said, his his work, he, he you could tell he's a great draftsman, but he, from what I understand and what I can see in his work, he kind of drew with the side of the pencil, which made inking him a little bit more. I don't want to say problematic, but there was more. It was more of a challenge for the inker to decide. Okay, what is the meaning of the mark that uh, Gene Colon is making here. And then we can see here on this fade, face of Daredevil where half the, half the face is in shadow and the other fa other half isn't. Uh, that's kind of one of the tells of Gene Colon's style. I'll bring back up that one image that kind of teed me off, even though it's much smaller in scale. But here's the gimmick showing half the face in light, half in, in shadow. Again, there it is. So there we go. A little bit of history lesson. Um, also goes to show that it, it pays to read your comics. Don't slab them. Open them up. You're not going to see this excellent work by both two great masters of the craft, Joe Kubert and Gene Colin. There you go. I'm def definitely going to be on the lookout. I, I'm after having read this and picked up the the first appearance of the Unknown Soldier. I'm more into the the DC Silver Age War books, so I hope to pick up more of those. But hey, that's all I got for today. So if you like this video, it's a little bit different. Hope you like it. Uh, smash that like button. Uh, subscribe if you're not subscribed, and uh, we'll see you next time. Remember, keep your priorities straight. Faith, family, comic books. See you next time. Bye, Sergeant Rock and the German on your back.